know, eight years ago. I uh, was married for 20 years to a woman and we each had a boy. And so we were kind of pioneering lesbian moms at that time. And uh, that ended about 10 years ago and I didn't really know what to do with my life. So I started this, uh, this someone's at the door. I started this website, which is a multi-contributor blog. And I've met a lot of people, and I found out a lot about our culture, stuff that I hadn't really known about. I've been kind of living, raising kids, and being kind of like, um, just a sort of average lesbian mom. You know? Living life, raising kids. So they grew up, and I decided it was important to, to do something that mattered in the world and give back to this community. So now I'm going to introduce Kathy, who is one of the women in my book. Hi, my name's uh, Kathy Belch, and um, I'm a writer. I, I used to write this advice column in Curve magazine. It was called Lipstick and Dipstick. It was a lesbian advice column from the Butch and Femme perspective. Um, anyone here read that? Okay. And there's uh, the person. I even published two books. Uh, one of the books is Lipstick and Dipstick's Essential Guide to Lesbian Relationships, which is a stunning novel as an ebook. And also, I've written a book for queer teenagers called Queer. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that's basically who I am. I'm a writer and a journalist, um, and I uh, have a great interest in lesbian history, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Okay, so. I was, um, Kathy and I put together this presentation and then Clepsicon reached out to us and um, Charlotte Robinson wanted to come involved and we were very impressed with her background and we're going to give her some time at the end to talk about what she does. So let me let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Charlotte Robinson. I'm an Emmy Award winning producer. Um, I worked in broadcast when you couldn't be gay and if people found out you, you were gay, you could, be, you, know, you could be dismissed on the spot. So it was a pretty heavy time, but it was kind of fun too because you became an outlaw. So, you know, it, I got to a certain point where um, I couldn't, you know, stand not being my own self, so finally I left. I worked for ABC, NBC, and CBS, and I got the Emmy Award from CBS Sports. So that's pretty much, you know, that level of it. And um, when I went off by myself, I just kind of did freelance program developing. I uh, just went on an adventure of seeing where things would lead me because I really never intended to leave CBS. I thought I was going to be there for life. So what happened uh, when the whole gay marriage thing happened, and I'm um, based in Boston, and I'm originally from Boston, and when the whole gay marriage thing happened, I picked up my camera, went down there and started shooting, and it turned into a short film, and the short film morphed into a LGBT news network, and so for the last 10 years, that's what I've been doing. And uh, we've, had, we've done about um, over 500 podcasts with LGBT leaders and tried to give people a, a voice and we promote a lot of events and such for our community. And also, you know, just giving people a voice. And it's, um, we're also a, a, a Google News source, which means that every story that we, you know, we post gets picked up in Google News with a picture within 20 minutes. That's so it's, it's pretty amazing. Thank you. Well, I'll talk um, more later about that. Yeah, later. did you guys hear um, the podcast that she did to introduce this event? I don't know if you heard it, but it's it's all. Um, I think it's still on the website. Yeah, it's so. there. Yeah. So anyway, let me get started. Okay. So first of all, last time I was in Vegas, it wasn't very long ago, and um, I got a text through Facebook from my eighth grade teacher, who is now in her seventies. Okay, still sexy, unbelievably. <laughs> and, anyway, so she reaches out to me and she says, Robin, I want to meet with you at like the Hooters bar and I have this uh, confession to make. And I'm thinking, and this is a true story. I'm horrified. I'm like, wow, but, but I'm also really excited. Like maybe, maybe she loved me as much as I loved her. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, she was 23 and I was 14 or something like that when, we, when I was in junior high. Anyway, it was my first girl crush just out of my mind. Um, so, she and I meet, and we're talking, and it comes out, believe it or not, that she almost slept with my 16-year-old prom date, uh, this dude. So I was sort of like, oh man, you guys are going to have to help me through this. That was sad. <laughs> sad story. Anyway, so I'm back in Vegas, and I want to just talk about this book. So, I gave you a little bit of my background. When I had the big breakup, uh, I didn't know what to do, so I started, my kid was in high school, and I started volunteering for the local LGBT center, um, going into the classroom, talking about gay stereotypes, how they affect um, 
discrimination and blah, blah, blah. So I, I started to get a voice uh, about this subject and get excited about it. And then with the blog, I thought, well, gosh, I just know all these people. And I'm one of these connector people that seems to know so many. Um, and so then the FAIR Act got passed. I don't know if you heard about it, but it was this FAIR Accurate Inclusive Respectful Education Act. It has to do with that they need to include LGBT history and social studies in the public school curriculum in California starting now. Now, they're not really going to implement that, just like they didn't implement segregation or whatever, until we sort of push this through and say, look, here's resources, you know. They don't have money for it, so I thought, you know, we're going to talk a lot about gay men. You know they are. So why don't we talk about lesbians? Why don't we talk about lesbians who created culture and, you know, this is, these are the shoulders of the women that we're all standing on now as um, queer people in, in a much more accepting society. So the women that were in my generation, you know, like Kathy and Charlotte, um, we have big stories to tell about what our lives were like and how hard that was. So this became my passion project, to do this book, to get into the schools, and how am I going to do this? Here I am like a curator, or editor, designer, graphic designer, but I don't really know much about writing, So, I, but I know how to get people to tell their stories. So I invited all these awesome women to like tell me a little bit about themselves. And um, then I did illustrated timelines and whatever, made it really fun. So then I thought, well, how am I going to pay for this? So I thought, oh, crowdfunding, right? And I'm like, whoa, that is the scariest most, it, don't try to do crowdfunding if you have a day job and you're kind of insecure and you don't really know that much about it, but I realized I've been given back all this time to, with Apocalypse e-magazine, whatever, um, promoting everyone's business and promoting everyone's events and just because I thought it was interesting. So I figured it's okay to ask, you know. So I went out and I asked, I raised $20,000 and I printed 500 of these beautiful books and, you know, there's cards in there that could slip out of envelopes I had to... I had to have a series of parties where everybody came and like assembled them, so I'm like feeding people and we just had fun with it. I'm so glad that part's done. My next edition will not have those cards in it. Thank you very much. So, moving on. Um, why lesbians? Well, you know, a lot of people co contacted me and said, do you have to use that ugly word? It's really ugly. And I'm like, wow, is it? You know, because... When I came out, that was the only word there was. We didn't have the choice of like being queer or somewhere in between or fluid or, it was all about you choose, gay, straight, do you like girls or not, you know? And I was like, I like girls. Um, so I didn't have a lot of choice around that. And so that was something that we just embraced. And you know, it's, it's disappearing now. It's not in vogue and that's cool, you know? But I, I'm just interested in like keeping the history alive. Like so that we know where we came from. We know why uh, things are the way they are now. And as open as accepting as they are, there's a lot of room for that to go further. So there's a nice quote in here by my friend Bonnie Morris. She's in the book. She says, most historians still fail to inscribe the accomplishments of lesbian pioneers in our textbooks. And that's the idea that there's nothing in the textbooks about anything. If you, like, just this year they went to Sacramento and fought to include LGBT history in the textbooks. Like, the fight for gay marriage was simply not in there. It's like, how do you teach history and not talk about major things that happen in our culture. Well, they want to just erase it, you know? And so we're not, we're not putting up with it. That's why the book. So I just wanted to start with Kathy, who has extensive background in uh, the culture of the women that these women in this book, the shoulders they stood on were these women, and, and how it all kind of started in the 50s and 60s. She's going to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so first, my disclaimer, I didn't live through this time, but it's a big, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm younger than I look. Um, uh, but it's definitely been an interest of mine since, uh, since I came out, really, because for me, I really wanted to know about the history and culture where I came from. Um, and so the first thing that I want to talk about is lesbian pulp fiction. So um, this is a, a, a passion of mine. I have a, these are all my books. I have a personal collection of more than 100 of these lesbian pulp novels, which I didn't bring, or I didn't want to be to bring them, but I was a little bit worried about that. But I brought some of the, they, a lot of these have been reprinted, um, which you can pick up. Um, this one is actually one of the most famous, uh, Be Will Breaker by Anne Bannon. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about her, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing, an amazing woman. Um, but 
Pulp Fiction, the reason we call it Pulp Fiction is the paper that it was printed on. And uh, this started after the war uh, in the 50s, and there was all genres of Pulp Fiction. There was science fiction, there was murder mysteries, there was um, true stories and things like that. And they were, this was like the first time books were sold to a mass audience in um, bus depots and in drug stores and things like that. And they were easy to pick up and they were cheap. And you could, you know, the idea was you would read it and you would just like leave it on the bus seat when you were done with it. And in the 1950s, Gold Medal, which you'll see that first book there, Women's Barracks, uh, kind of started printing these racy books with these sexy themes to them. And they were written primarily by men um, for a male audience. Um, a lot of them using pseudonyms, women's pseudonyms, um, but some of them were actually written by women. Um, these three up here are examples. The Women's Barracks uh, was the first book that came out, and it, it was like wildly popular. As a matter of fact, uh, it got called up before the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1953 uh, for being pornographic. And of course, this helped the sales of the book. <laughs> and then launched this whole genre of lesbian fiction. And um, there was, um, they were, there was, uh, there was always something in the books, though, that was a little bit, uh, that had to have like a moral stance. It had to kind of be against, you know, being queer in a way. And Valerie Taylor, who is one of the authors who came out later as lesbian, um, uh, said this about what her editor told her. He said, the only restriction he gave me was it couldn't have a happy ending, otherwise the post office might seize the books as obscene. Um, but still, women found these books, and they were able to read through the stories um, and see themselves. And I have a quote from Catherine Forrest, who some of you may know, she was a writer of uh, lesbian fiction in the 80s. Yeah, she's written some blogs on my, on my website too. Okay, so um, it just kind of set the scene about what, what the era was like for her to like find one of these books. Lesbian pulp, lesbian pulp fiction paperback first appeared before my disbelieving eyes in Detroit, Michigan, 1957. I did not need to look at the title for clues. The cover leaped out at me from, sorry, leaped out at me from the drugstore rack. A young woman with sensuous intent on her face, seated on a bed, leaning over a prone woman, her hands on the other woman's shoulders. Overwhelming need led me to walk a gantlet of fear up to the cash register. Fear so intense that I remember nothing more, only that I stumbled out of the store in possession of what I knew I must have, a book to me as necessary as air. The book was Odd Girl Out by Ann Bannon. I found it when I was 18 years old. It opened the door to my soul and told me who I was. It led me to other books that told me some of who some of us were and how some of us lived. Finding this book back then and what it meant to me is my touchstone to our literature and its valued meaning. Yet no matter how many times I try to write or talk about that day in Detroit, I cannot convey the power of what that was like. You had to be there. And so I think um, when we look through, we look back at history, I think sometimes we look through it through our own lens, but to put yourself back in that time period where, I mean, there was nothing. So to find these books was really a lifesaver for these women. Um, have any of you ever seen the movie uh, Claire, uh, Carol? Yeah. Carol, which was based on one of these lesbian pulp fictions from um, 1952, I believe, The Price of Salt by um, Patricia Highsmith, who was writing under the pseudonym Claire Morgan at the time, who was one of the lesbians who were actually penning these books. Um, and another great thing about these books was the artwork, and it really drew, you know, and that's why they become, I think, iconic and classic now, as, as well as for the content. And there was always uh, a, an indication in the title to give, well, to let lesbians know. Where was it, it's like, wasn't Price of Salt the first one with a positive uh, outcome? It, yeah, it was actually, yeah, it was uh, touted as one of the first books that had a positive outcome, because the two ended up together in the end even though she lost custody of her child, but. Um, 
Oh, was that? That, that comes later. <laughs> That's Robin's story. We should tell you about that. Uh, so they had the words like shadow, stranger, odd, twisted, so that women, like people would know what they were going to find in these books. Um, and one of the big things that these books depicted at the time was the lesbian bar scene. Uh, the bar culture of the time, and it, it, it and this was um, again a place that was 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 a mixed. There was mixed things here. Women could come to the bars to to be free, find a sense of community, meet friends, you know, maybe pick up a lover. But um, but there are. That's woman right here. Look at her. Look at her face. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's totally lusting after her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the bar scene, kind of like, I mean, we don't really have lesbian bars anymore, which is really sad, but back in, in the 50s, I mean, they were sometimes a sad place, but they were the place where a woman could go and let her guard down and be who she was and flirt and all these things you couldn't do out in the straight world. You would lose your job, you could, you could literally be arrested. Um, you know, thrown from your families. It was it was a pretty uh, a different time. These bars were often in like dark warehouse districts. They were often owned by the mafia, and I'm sure all of you know that they were often raided by the police. Uh, be, and and on trumped up, you know, they would come up with trumped up charges. Uh, for example, there was a a raid of a bar uh, in the 1960s, and um, like 36 women were arrested on charges of like attending a house of ill repute or something like that. Um, the signals. And there were the clothing ones too. There were the, the you, had, you had to wear three pieces of clothing of your appropriate gender or you could be arrested for that. So who's wearing boxers? <laughs> I, don't, I think I would be arrested right now. Even my shoes are. I had a cool signal story. She, yeah, she, she, I'm into it. I'm into it. Um, so, because different cities had different laws and whatnot, in some cities it was illegal for two, the same sex to be dancing together. So when the cops would come, there was a certain bar, I think it was in Los Angeles, that this red light would come on and the, the couples knew to switch partners then and dance you know, with an opposite sex. Um, but it was scary. I mean, people would get arrested, their names would be printed in the paper, and then they would lose their jobs. So for women to go to these bars was, was pretty risky. Um, and the bars also catered, I think, kind of like bars today. Well, at least they catered to a younger crowd, but they also catered to more like a working class crowd. They catered more to um, a, like women of color. So. Um, before I get to that, though, I do want to. There was also kind of an expectation of butch femme uh, at a lot of the clubs, and women. Some women felt like they they really needed to choose in order to fit in. So while we were creating this community where women could be themselves, like not idea of butch femme. And I have a, a really great quote here from Joe Nessel, who, if you don't know, is this wonderful femme writer. Um, and this is from her book called I think it's called. Her desire, uh, all about her her life. She did live through this time. Um, and there was a lot of backlash towards the butch femme uh, scene, especially in the 80s, and this was kind of her response to that. The butch femme relationship, as I experienced with them, were complex, erotic statements, but not and not phony heterosexual replicas. They were filled with a deeply lesbian language of stance, dress, gesture, gesture, loving courage and autonomy. None of the butch women I was with, and this included passing women, ever presented themselves to me as men. So um, that was just kind of her response to some of the backlash we got. And so in addition to the bar scene, um, there was these two women, uh, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, who in the 1950s wanted to create an alternative to the bar scene. They wanted a place to socialize, meet other women, to dance. Uh, so in 1955, they started Daughters of Belitis, which quickly became, um, a, a, organizations popped up in many different cities. 
and they published this uh, magazine called The Ladder, which I think was the first lesbian publication in the United States. And women around the country would receive this in this plain brown wrapper. And, um, and it was literally a lifeline for women across the country to find that there were other people like them. And they quickly realized that they needed to not just be involved in like social things, but in social change. And that's what Daughters of the Lightest came and kind of became the, um, the, the starting point for kind of the lesbian and queer rights movement with the Madison Society, which also started up around the same time. And Della and Phyllis became activists their whole, state activists their whole lives. And they, there is a picture of them later, Robin's going to show it. They're not really in my book, but they're, they're part of it. They're part of it because they were the first couple that was married in San Francisco in, in 2004 when, when gay marriage became. So anyway, that's kind of what I have to say. I think we'll have time at the end for questions if you have them, but yeah, think about your questions because we will answer them. Okay, so back to the book thing. Um, let's see. So I, I ended up highlighting all these great women, and there's, there's the first one. This is Monica Palacios. And I had a lot of fun with it. I think I was inspired by the Pulp Fiction graphic novel style-ish. And um, like I said, I, I curated these stories. So in her case, everyone, everyone gets six pages. There's 30 of them. Um, not all of them get six pages, but the main 17 do. And like her deal was that she was named, they named it um, Monica Palacios Day, the mayor of LA, for her 30 year career as a pioneer and Chicana lesbian performer. So that's a pretty big deal. So, so her biggest accomplishment, and then a, an illustrated timeline for everyone with little cool things about their lives. Um, and then <laughs> I get to Jewel Gomez, who is one of the women, um, one of the rooms here is named after her. She's a, she's a good friend, she's an amazing woman. And I wanted to just read her story really quickly. Like, this is what I asked them to tell me about. What was your big aha moment? She said, images have a big place in the way I define myself. How I move writing forward and how political uh, core is shaped. A paper bag is where it started. I moved to New York City right after college in 1971, and although I was a lesbian from an early age, at least eight years old, I was too shy to join the Gay Pride March. I'd heard the marchers go by in my West Village flat, but I didn't know any lesbians, and I'd seen movies, read the books. Lesbians were best invisible and at worst demonized. But I didn't feel ashamed, only befuddled. Growing up poor and colored, I already knew the world was a scary place, so I took after my Native American great-grandmother. I watched and waited for the moment that felt right for the people who were my people. Finally, one day I decided, go down to the march, stand on the sidewalk, or march first. Just, or march, just go. I watched for a while, with my eyes filling with tears as each contingent went by. Then I saw a group of New York City school teachers marching most of them with brown paper bags over their heads. They refused to stand on the sidewalk, even though they knew it wouldn't mean the end of their careers. I was filled with so many feelings I could barely stand up. Fury that they had to cover their faces, pride that they didn't stay home, embarrassed that I'd been too shy. Next thing I knew, I'd thrown myself in the middle of the stream of queer humanity as, it's made, as it made its way down Fifth Avenue. And I haven't missed a march since or forgotten personal is political. Now she and her partner, um, became one of the first defendants for the gay marriage that they were married and then, like I was married, many of you may know about that, but we went down to City Hall, got married in that little window, and my kids were there, they were so excited, they were like, this means you're going to be together forever, you know, unfortunately that wasn't the case, <laughs> but um, the point is, it meant a lot to the kids, I mean, think about that, and, and then, you know, a few weeks later we received in the mail the annulment, which was when they changed the law, so we got our money back and we got our certificate saying we were annulled. Unbelievable. Um, okay, so then she wrote these fantastic books about lesbian, what else? Lesbian vampires, why not? And she wrote a play and it just goes on and on. Now, uh, Mariah Hansen is a, is a friend and she's a, an amazing woman. Obviously she does the Dinah. And what she ended up doing was, was discovering all these great acts. And I don't know if you know, she was the first one to show Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, and they went on to become famous, so she had a knack of discovering people. Um, now this woman, Donna Hitchens, oh my gosh, she is fantastic. What she did was literally, 
she's the first out lesbian elected judge, but she also literally wrote the book on how to defend um, two-parent adoption, which, which was close to my heart, because when I was, uh, when we first had our kids, like, so my partner, we used my brother for the donor, this is 1990, uh, and so here comes baby Max, you know, and we had to fill out our birth certificates, and I had to put, we had, she had to put unknown for the father. There's all these legal ramifications around how to do that, and we had to, she had to be the only mother, and then we had to go to court and, like, actively petition that I became the mother, and the judge would, like, scold us and say, are you sure you want to give up your right to that child? And we're like, yes, like, it was just this awful thing, or else she couldn't have gone to school and pick him up, say he needed to go to the hospital, or I couldn't, and then later I had it my own child, not with my brother, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we use an unknown donor for him. So these guys are cousins by birth, uh, brothers by family, and um, they're really close. They're six years apart. It's very sweet. So my younger son ended up uh, doing the Indiegogo video very passionately. For, that really helped raise that money. Anyway, um, he, the, neither of the kids are gay either, which is awesome. They, we all like girls. <laughs> <laughs> so Franco, who did Curve Magazine, who Kathy worked for, she, she, she's an amazing person. Um, this is Judy Delugas, who does Olivia. I've been on many cruises. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's super fun. Um, yeah, it's really worth it. Um, let's see. This cracks me up. Um, the, in, in the year 2000, they went to Turkey. I went to Turkey with them three years ago, but it wasn't quite like this. But when they first went there, they were on the cover of every uh, newspaper in Turkey. Um, lesbians are here, you know. And, <laughs> and they had, um, they pumped more than half a million dollars into the local economy that was lagging. So it was a big deal. Look at these women. Look at what they're wearing. <laughs> Look at that mullet. So good. Okay. Uh, then Jenny Olsen is amazing. She wrote all these great books about movies and. So she's an authority on LGBTQ film and writing. Now, Kate Kendall. I don't know if many of you know her from NCLR. She, here's the great picture of her. This is when Dell and, well, I guess Dell had already passed away. So yeah. this is Phyllis Lyon hugging the, the judge or somebody there. <laughs> and, and they had just, they had just overturned. Uh, yeah, 2015, that was the day. So Kate Kendall was instrumental in, in getting that to happen. NCLR defended it. Um, now, here's Kathy's page. Look at Kathy's dog! Aww. This is the love of her life. You know what I hear? Um, anyway, so what Kathy did, which I found amazing, was she didn't just write this book for queer teens. She, she wrote a book, and I'm going to read you what they said in Goodreads. It says, teen life is hard enough with all the pressure kids face, just for teens who are... But for teens who are LGBT, it's even harder. When do you decide to come out? To whom? Will your friends accept you? How on earth do you meet people to date? Queer is a humorous, engaging, and honest guy that helps LGBT uh, teens come out to friends and family, navigate new LGBT social life, figure out if a crush is also queer, and rise up against bigotry and homophobia. So it's not just about STDs, right? So this is the first time that was done, which is amazing. Okay, now Marga is an old, old friend. I've known her since she's when she first started comedy. And she wrote this hilarious story. Uh, it was 1994, I'd been doing stand-up comedy for 10 years when the legendary comedian and gay ally Robin Williams invited me to, pour, to perform on HBO's Comic Relief. I said, totally, but my head was terrified, not so much about making my television debut, but about coming out to the world. I was great at already being out, but coming out required muscles I hadn't developed. I never got to come out to my parents. When I was 19, they caught me with my, and me and my friend smooching. Rather than deal with their homophobic drama, I quit school, left my home in New York, moved to San Francisco where everyone assumed you were LGBT. <laughs> there was nobody to come out to there. So I started performing at a local gay comedy club, which led to playing pride rallies all over the country. Soon I became lesbian famous without ever having to come out. Then I got the HBO gig. Coming out on television was uncharted territory in 1994. This was before Ellen came out, before the L word. My agent gave me typical advice. You can be a lesbian in Hollywood, just don't bring it up. If I'd listened to him, I might be a rich lady today. <laughs> but just before I stepped in front of the television cameras, I remembered my 19-year-old self 
packing her suitcase, escaping her family, and feeling scared and alone. And I knew that she would want what she would want me to do. So I said, hi folks, let me tell you about myself. I'm part Cuban, part Puerto Rican, part lesbian, and I'm not into labels. I only bring it up because I know some of you folks have a problem with Cubans. <laughs> so she has, oh my gosh, she has this fantastic woman, woman show right now. It's playing in San Francisco and getting rave reviews. So if you ever had a chance to see that, it's so worth it. She dresses in drag and looks exactly like her dad. It's, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then there's femme lesbians. This is a really interesting story. I was like, wow, femme lesbians are cool. And this is uh, Diane Anderson Minshaw. She's now the editor of uh, The Advocate. And here's just my list of folks. And oh. yeah, we were gonna um, not show that. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a 10 minute um, do, what do, we, do we want to do a few questions now, or do we want to wait and let her do her... Why don't we let you do your ten minutes? Okay. Where's my picture? <laughs> oh, did Let's you have go. it? No, she put it's at the beginning. We had that. We showed it. We want your picture again? Yeah. yeah, it was up when you were... Really? It was up when you were doing yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, what? Yeah. You can look oh, yeah. right at it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, the thing that I'm more... Uh, are a lot of you in, you know, interested in television and broadcasting and uh, programming and things on that level? I mean, it was very, very different uh, when I got involved in, I, I mean, when I was four years old and they brought in a television in the house, I knew I wanted to get involved with this. And at that time, there were only three networks, and we were talking the 50s. And every, you know, most people just felt like, you're wasting your you know, life watching television, it's not going to amount to anything. You know, you're just never going to get anywhere. And you just kind of, you know, I always knew that they were wrong, and I just kept on pursuing and pursuing it because I felt that television was my only ticket out, really. It was like, um, you know, people, the, at the time, you, when I went off to college, there wasn't even uh, television programming in college. All there was was theater. So you got involved with theater, and then you just kind of, you know, hoped for the best. And while I was, uh, I went to the University of New Mexico, and they actually had progressive rock station, I became a DJ. And you pick up these, these skills as you go along, you build your credibility, and it's just amazing what you can do with it. And it just gives you more and more uh, a chance to meet some amazing people that will bring you, you know, along the way. And then you kind of, you know, pay your dues in a sense of bringing them along, you know, like people like who are in this room. And when I started, um, uh, you know, I was working in, uh, my, my TV, my, my radio show was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was very difficult to get a, I wanted to get a real job. And they said, but you're from, you know, you're from Boston. You're not going to stay here. And I said, oh, great. I'll go to Boston and tell them, well, I'm going to be here forever. And that, you know, it really worked. And I worked for WGBH in Boston. I was a production assistant for a woman named uh, Paula Absol, and she took me under her wing. And now she's the executive producer of Nova, and she's been there forever. And uh, while I was there, I wanted, you know, when you work for WGBH, you want to be there forever, and it, it's sort of like there was um, nothing really happening there, but there was a ABC affiliate that was just about to go on the air, and uh, so they, they kind of said, well, maybe we can help you, and uh, at that time, the, the women's movement was just beginning, so I just kind of worked that whole situation as much as I possibly could, and uh, I got a job at WCBB as a first... Uh, well, it was an audio engineer, but they just call it technical at the time. And you have to become uh, a union brother. So I became a member of the IBW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which was really crazy. And um, there was a such resent, you know, resentment from the from the men of why are we giving you know this woman a girl a job because it's, you know we should be supporting our brothers. And you know, like I was about. I was like 21 years old and kind of dealing with this kind of, uh, you know, intense stress of, you know, being the first person ever hired. And um, I stayed at CBB, CBB, WCBB in Boston was one of the most amazing places. Um, first of all, it was a brand new, a brand new station and everyone had to learn the equipment and no one noticed that I was learning it for the first time. And you just kind of had to keep your back up like that, just keep, you know, I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> 
And um, I stayed there for, uh, for four years, picked up all my experience that I possibly could, and then I went off to New York because everyone said that's you know, where to go. I got a job for uh, ABC, NBC, and then I got a staff position with CBS. And when I was at CBS, I worked for, uh, I worked for Walter Cronkite, I worked for Dan Rather, I worked for the news divisions, I worked for the soap operas, uh, uh, Guiding Light, and As the World Turns, which was pretty amazing. And it was a kind of like a, you couldn't be out, you know, at all, but there were a lot of people who were gay, so you kind of had this like, you know, uh, counterculture within, but you still couldn't say, you know, you know, you had to change the names, you know, I was, I was out with someone last night or something like that. But it was pretty obvious that all the women that were calling there, you know, to, to ask for me, it was never a man calling, it was always women. And it was, I remember one time one of my favorite little stories was, there was this gay uh, guy that I was really close with and he turned me on places like, you know, taking me out at two, uh, club, you know, Studio 54 and such. And we were just kind of hanging out at his, uh, you know, as an audio engineer, we were just kind of hanging out in his room. And they actually wrote us up for, you know, avert heterosexual behavior. <laughs> Which we thought was really hysterical. <laughs> but, um, you know, so the, the, my bosses in the beginning were really, you know, they were cool. I wanted to work in the soap operas. There were more gay people in the soap operas. I mean, it was mostly gay people working there. But again, no one could be out. And if, you, you, you know, like every once in a while you just kind of really want to say, you know, I'm gay, I'm gay, but if you did, you could be dismissed on the spot. So it's really a difficult time. But uh, it was funny because CBS News was doing you know, stories, the gay, gay movement was just beginning, and they would come over to me and, and tell me about their stories. I mean, everyone knew, but they, you know, but you couldn't say it. You couldn't say it out loud. It was hiding. And I decided, I'm going to go for it. And what happened with that was, you know, all of a sudden it kind of came out, and it was like this big scandal within the soap opera. Kind of funny. And, you know, it's just sort of like, you can't even believe this is happening. Most of the, you know, you have adventures that, that you just can't even believe that they're, they're real. So uh, my boss, this is how they handled it, my boss brought me into the office and said, you can't go to Guiding Light anymore. <laughs> and he said, um, you know, it, not even in the sense of reason, he said, but we were putting off, you know, for you working, because I didn't want to work with CBS Sports, but I don't want to work with all these jocks. I don't want to deal with this. That's really, you know, this seemed like the most dangerous place for me to possibly to work. And he said, we can't keep you away from there anymore. You have to go to CBS Sports. And I said, okay. And I, you know, sucked it up. You know, at the time, I mean, I weighed about 50 pounds less than I do now. I was, I was kind of like all pumped out. I had a purple streak in my hair. I had a pink jacket and, you know, I had turquoise uh, beetle boots. I figured if they can handle with this, then maybe it's going to be okay. And so I, I worked for uh, CBS Sports, I worked on the NFL Today, and I won an Emmy Award. And it was sort of like, well, this is perfect. You see, they threw me off a guy from like, they pushed me into CBS Sports, and I won this Emmy Award. So that was pretty fabulous. And then one time, it was, you know, my boss who was all of a sudden was kind of a nasty boss who really wanted to get, you know, get rid of me because he had read the report that I, I possibly might be a lesbian. So um, he, he, tell, he told me that what they're going to do is they're going to send me on the road with CBS Sports. And I said, oh great, this is really perfect. I'm going to go on the road with all these guys. I'm going to have to continue to you know, hide my whole sexuality and everything else. And so I said, I had been invited by the, uh, the band, The Who, to come to London to do Simon Townsend's video for MTV. And I figured this is perfect. So I went to my boss and I said, I really have to think about what my future is here. I need some time off. And he said, okay. And I went off to London. And it's completely changed, you know, it's just amazing what, you know, what opportunities will come once you, start, you know, have some sort of an idea and commitment of, of this is what you want to do with your life. And um, so I stayed in New York for, you know, for a number of years and finally uh, in the uh, 90s I returned back to Boston to deal with my family's mortality. And when I did that, there's nothing in Boston with TV to a certain degree, but there's politics like unbelievable. And I heard about Vlad, and I heard about all this marriage equality type of things that are just beginning to come out. And I went to a fundraiser and I met Mary Bernardo, who's, I believe that she, you know, I really feel that she is the uh, architect of marriage equality in this country. And they were all talking about, you know, gay marriage, gay marriage. And I went up to her and I said, yeah, like, right, this is going to happen. And she said, no, it is, because they don't have anything to keep it from happening. And that's when they started changing all the laws throughout the country. So um, when the, 
back when everything started happening in, in Massachusetts when they passed gay marriage, and all, you know, like there were still so many demonstrations and things that were going on, you know, at the state house and such, which was unbelievable. I took my little Instamatic camera, you know, one of those little throwaways, and I went down there and started taking pictures. And no, you know, people let me because it wasn't, you know, it was really unassuming. And I put them all together, and uh, when gay marriage was about to actually pass in uh, 2004 on May 17th, I hired a crew and we went down and we really did a, you know, a, a documentary that I, you know, that kind of uh, opened up so many avenues for me. And what happened with uh, the documentary is that, um, you know, I won a few film festivals and things like that. And then I got to a point like, what do I do? And I brought it to CBS News and they, we really liked this, this is great, but they could do a show. I mean, it was just like, you just couldn't, it was like a no-win situation. And, and then I felt like I was a criminal in a certain sense because I'm trying to pass the, you know, help people understand and evolve about gay marriage. But it kept, you know, it kept on being such a, you know, an issue. So finally I got to a point where I uh, went, met this woman who was, had a documentary film company. I said, what do I do with this film? And she said, you have two choices here. You put it up on YouTube, or you can build a network around it. And I said, oh, that makes sense. And I built a network around this. In the last 10 years, we've, uh, globally, we have millions and millions and millions of viewers. And uh, at the point where we had with, um, um, I got to a point where uh, I decided that it was before podcast really, it was just kind of like in the sense of an audio interview. And I went to a film festival, at Carl Sound Film Festival, and I met Alan Ball, who did um, uh, American Graffiti, excuse me, American Beauty, and also uh, Six Feet Under. And I asked him if he would be interested in doing an interview. And he said, yes, I would. And once I got that interview under my belt, if anyone said, you know, you know, you know I don't want to do it, I said, well, Alan Ball did it. And it really worked. And so now we have over 500 people of LGBT leaders and allies who have been doing interviews. And it's, uh, I work with about five consistent publicists, but I get, I get offers about, I would get about, about 20 people a day wanting to, you know, to be on our show. And about 20 people a day who want us to promote you know, anything. That, so it kind of comes to me at this point. So awesome. it's really kind of an interesting thing. So I get to the point where we're going to turn it into a, a streaming network. Nice. So, um, who wants to come? <laughs> <laughs> Thank who you, Charlotte. That is fantastic. <laughs> Appreciate all that. All right, so um, I want to open up for questions. We have about five minutes. And uh, if, if you have a question, please shout it out. Raise your hand. And if there aren't any questions, which I hope there are, who's got a question? Everybody? Yes, yay. Where can we get your book? Okay, well, I, thank you for asking. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so it is going to be. Ta -da, ta -da. Is it table 305? And there's free swag just for attending this. If you guys come over there, I'll have something cool for you. Just say you were here. A little something, something. But the books are for sale. And um, yeah, it's just so dear to my heart. I and you can buy one for yourself and buy one and donate it to your local high school or junior high as well. That is a great idea. That's what a lot of people are doing. They love them. The librarians are excited. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, I wanted to get into lesbian cult novels and like check out some of the classics. Do you have like a couple of recommendations if you haven't read me? Uh, recommendations of where to start? Yeah. If you haven't read any yet. Oh, you haven't read any? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely start with Anne Bannon and the Bebo Breaker series. Uh, and you can find those. They've been republished many times, and uh, they're, they're just, they're definitely a great intro, and it's, I think there's like three or four of them, and they all kind of follow the same characters. You definitely, I mean, it's, there's just something about these novels that just really takes you back into another era that, you know, you can feel the angst, but you can also feel like that, you know, that titillation of the first time you, like, went to a lesbian bar or somewhere where you saw, like, lesbians. It's really, you know, anyway. It's a common experience, yes. Sort of follow up on that, do you have a good suggestion of a, a website or a place where we can find them, or just like, Amazon? They're on Amazon. Yeah, if you just you can, go yeah, to the, there's, um, if you want to find the originals, they're, they're pretty spendy, they can be at this point. 
but um, many of them have been reprinted. Um, and, and Clea's Press is one of the uh, places that's reprinted a lot of them. Um, yeah, you can just go, just Google lesbian pulp fiction and see what you find. here I found for free. Robin said, take the free, free sticker off or else someone's going to steal it. <laughs> um, but yeah. And even these reprints from the 80s are, are worth like 20, 30 bucks right now. It's crazy. Anything else? You guys want to play a game and try to win a book? Yeah. Yay. Okay. Do what are we going to do? So we're going to have, two, uh, gonna have two people come up. How are you going to do it? Let's, two volunteers, you and you. Bring them up. All right. <laughs> we got some lesbian trivia. Lesbian trivia. Come on over here and stand so people can see you and your beautiful faces. Uh, what, is your, what are your names? Ricky Beth. Ricky Beth? I'm October. Hi, I'm October. Hi. That's amazing. All right, so here is the first question. What is Babeland? Sex toy shop. Oh. Oh, you didn't even ask us a question, but that was kind of obvious. But anyway, I think they're funny. Olivia's <laughs> Or a Christmas story. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, don't, it isn't okay. first, I'll, I'll give you guys okay. both a chance. <laughs> and, I don't know, you probably know everything. She knows, she knows everything. <laughs> uh, what was the original code name for the L word before filming began? A, Pussies and Palm Trees. B, L Dogs of Sodom. <laughs> C, Earthlings. D, Lick It. I hope it's A. <laughs> Because, like, oh. Um, she got it. <laughs> yeah. But, but what was but I think for us, or whatever, it was they called Star Wars? She, yeah. gets a, she gets a check mark for loving the pussies and pussies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved it to be licked, but I. Didn't. Okay, next one. Oh. A gold star, because we only have like one more minute right now. A gold Two star more. is. Someone thrown out of the military for being gay. <laughs> B. How we identify wealthy queers. <laughs> Or C, someone who has never slept with a person of the opposite sex. C, yeah. One, <laughs> one, okay. But I thought it was pretty close. I thought the military one was a trick question. Okay, this is a, this is a hard one. We celebrate National Coming Out Day on October 11th because A, it's Liza Minnelli's birthday. B, is the anniversary of the second march on Washington for gay rights. C, the fall leaves look like a rainbow. <laughs> and D. It's the anniversary of the first march on Washington for gay rights. I'm gonna guess D. I'm gonna guess B. Ooh, oh, we have a winner! Yay! The second national march on Washington. Okay, so I think you're both winners. Yeah, I think so too. 1987. Where can they find you, Charlotte? Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs>